Well, great morning, everyone. It is an honor and indeed a privilege to be here with you all amazing people. I want to first give honor to the Salvation Army, to all of the majors and all of those who are here on staff, to Major Bill and uh, Major Brendan Schaefer, and as well as the cadets who are here and the, um, the captains as well. I also want to give a special thank you to my professor and preaching mentor, Dr. Andy Miller and his amazing family. Um, I am humbled always by your words and your presence. And as you all can see, I'm flying solo this morning. My wife and my one-year-old son are in Texas this morning to take care of a, a, a wonderful niece who's dealing with some challenges post-surgery. So she's going through some rehab. So they send their regards. But this morning, my friends, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. And I love that beginning of verse 7 where it says, but we have this treasure. I love that phrase, this treasure. Well, I want to place a tag there for you all this morning with the question for those of you in the room. And I want to ask this question, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? For just a moment, look around you. Maybe, just maybe, there are treasures hidden, tucked away in spaces that we often overlook. This is the revelation that Stephen Hoffer discovered there in his parents' aging suburbial home, that up above his head, high in between the dusty shadows of sealed and packaged items, he always insisted that something magnetic, mysterious, existed in the attic. So after 30 years of wandering, Hopper finally made it his mission to go up there and just look for himself. This attic, my friends, was filled with fumes of dust and pockets of poor ventilation. Sunlight oozed through these roofs, cracks, and crevices while darkness roamed throughout the room. As he wiggled you all through this, this tight space, he saw boxes everywhere, pressed down, worn, masked in with dated labels on them. And these labels gave these boxes names, themes, and the most obvious, dates. There were certain boxes with labels that read 1975 and, and 1976, but underneath these boxes, a certain ray of light shined upon this discarded set of boxes with the date 1977 roughly taped across them. My friends, they did not look like uh, the normal boxes. They stood out. These weren't just any boxes because in them, Stephen found 50 sets of first edition Star Wars collectible items. And in 1977, that represented that that very year was Star Wars' first trilogy and when it was released, it was as if he found some diamonds in the rough. This new attic discovery, my friends, was actually worth more than $20,000. What, what others overlook and often count it as useless, Stephen Hoffer saw them as valuable treasures. Isn't it ironic, though, that some of life's most significant possessions somehow end up in the unlikeliest places? Here in our text this morning in 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul is writing a similar, or writing of a similar treasure for a very zealous yet fragile first century church. And in it, his argument is clear. The wondrous and radiant glory of God continues to shine in even the unusual or most unlikely places. For the entire 16 verses of the first letter to Corinth, Paul lays a foundation for this church. As their leader, he is addressing themes of love, spiritual gifts, disciplines, and unity. And for him, each layer of ministry points to directly toward the incarnate Christ. But my friends, by the time we make it to Paul's second epistle, he has gotten word that there are tensions that are stirring again in this particular congregation. You see, like many of our Christian organizations today, this first century church is being split right down the middle by their differences regarding the authority and divinity of Jesus. Many of these Corinthians perceived that the newness of Christ and the Holy Spirit 
are received in impractical and unbiblical ways. And rather than interpreting Jesus as divine, some of these individuals in this congregation and amongst and with beyond their congregation see him through a filtered cloud of lens. And you all, Apostle Paul sounds like some of my brothers and sisters in Jackson. He's blunt about this thing. He's, he's not as passive with these words. He calls these people unbelievers who are blinded and who are falling away. And so in verses 3 through 5, Paul says, and even if this gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so if Jesus, my friends, is the image of God, what is this word veiled? What is Paul talking about? Who, who is perishing? And, and what baffles me is how can leaders and gods of this world blind people's minds? And, and, and for my brother Paul, I just got to ask him, brother, what in the world is this ministry that you're suggesting? And so for us to fully understand this type of language that Paul is speaking, we've got to back up just a bit to chapter 13, and maybe, just maybe, this will clear the air. I want to read verses 7 through 11. It says, but if the ministry of death engraved in letters on stone came with glory so that the sons of of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness excel in glory. For indeed what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which may, remains is in glory. Friends, this is good news. Because although we have done things in our past that have brought us shame and grief, there is glory that is far greater than our own guilt. Although we see these sad and unfortunate images that are raining and rolling across our TV screens. These may bring times of darkness and sadness, but for those who are in the body of Christ, we rejoice because God is with us. You see, here in this chapter, Paul is contrasting between two covenants. Moses, the Israelites, and the covenant that God made with them, and then to our right, Jesus and the New Testament church. And in verse 7, Paul holds nothing back, my friends. He suggests that the commandments that Moses once wrote on stones, they were glorious. They were effective. They were impactful. But eventually, it was a ministry that led to death and condemnation. God's glory was seen, but it faded away, my friends, because it pointed mainly to a man, Moses. And from verses 9 through 11, he connects the ministry of the Spirit. Somebody say the Spirit. Spirit. To the ministry of righteousness. For Paul, this is the glory that remains. Why? Why? Because this glory is far different than the one who came before it. And going down to chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, Paul says, Therefore, having such a hope. We use great boldness in our speech, and we are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not stare at the end of what was fading. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. And so, my friends, looking there at verse 14, the glory of this ministry that Paul is referencing for us remains because it points to Christ and not to ourselves. The recurrence of the word veil in chapter 3 gives us clues for the veil that Paul continues in chapter 4. Because even though that veil and that covenant pointed to Moses, Moses died. 
But unlike Moses, Jesus died, but Jesus lives. Amen. The old covenant's veil that was removed was removed because Jesus died, but he did not stay there. Amen. He got up, my friends, and he conquered death. Amen. But we have a lot of questions in the body of Christ that want to take away from the authority of God and the authority of his triumphness, of his ability to cover and create and, and own this world. These questions are, what if Jesus never really died? What if his death was a myth? A figurative expression for us to read just for leisure. What if what Paul is suggesting about life through someone's death is just a story? What happens to us in the redemption story? Better yet, my friends, if Paul is elaborating upon this wondrous gospel of Christ, why does he continue to make references to the dead things in Moses in the veil? Why is this cross-reference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant so necessary for the people there in Corinth? Paul's assumption, my friends, to the cross points directly to the atonement of Christ. He suggests that the death of Jesus empowers us to live, but to live well. His restoration of humanity reconciles us back to the life that God intended for us to always live. And also, my friend, Paul suggests that the glory of God is no longer intended to be hidden from us. God does, want, God does want to live amongst us, but he also wants to dwell in us. His glory is revealed through the face of Christ. You see, when we place faith in Jesus, God's glory comes alive in these mortal bodies of flesh. All throughout this text, my friends, I see rays of beaming light shining through Paul's mind and his imagination. It is as if the natural light from this natural sun is imagined as the glorious light of Jesus Christ. Those who believe in the crucified Christ have a radiating presence that cannot be hidden or covered. Through his death, the sun's light permeates through our mortal human bodies as the glory of God is revealed in us. It is this beautiful light for believers that shines in us. But this is also the same powerful light that blinds those who choose not to believe. So here again, my friends, we land at verse 7. But we have this treasure. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Again, I'm moved by this word treasure, my friends, because we all have them. Some of us value our money. Some of us value our relationships. Some of us value what we do have in our bank accounts, and others overvalue what they don't have in their bank accounts. But also, some of us are broken and, and beat down by our past. My question for us in the room today is again, what and where is your treasure? Another question to ask is, what has your heart? Is it in a person? Is it in the stock market? Is it in your own ability to lead your own self, your own life, your own family? Because I gotta be honest with you all, life as we know it is changing. Our Christian organizations are splitting it's splitting at a rapid pace. Inflation is raising gas prices across this country. And I'm going to be honest with you, they're getting so hot. I'm wondering if we could, are we going to be able to afford them in the next year. Right. Sanctions are being placed on Russia as Vladimir Putin is waging war on Ukraine and pushing the world into a nuclear corner. Nations are rising against nations and People's innocence are being taken as regions are being subdued. But friends, like Paul, we have this treasure. This treasure. And so since we're talking about treasures, I've got to be humbly honest with you guys. I have a problem, okay? I have a serious problem. I always lose my keys. I'm always losing my keys. And maybe I'm the only one in this room who will admit my thoughts, but I'm repenting of my sins this morning. <laughs> this issue, my friends, has caused so much lighthearted friction 
in my marriage between my wife and I because she always tells me, love, you have a problem. <laughs> and I only admit that I need help. I have lost house keys. I've lost house keys. I've lost lock keys. I've lost other people's keys. But just recently, I lost my car keys. And for two days, true story, my car sat in that freezing dry air of my mother-in-law's home and my beautiful black Honda Accord was just sitting there. And we were running out of options. And so my wife, who's smarter than I am, she had the brilliant idea, look, oh, let's just get some new car keys made. Okay. Let's just get some new ones made. And so I started to think, how can we get that accomplished? So she thought of the bright idea, let's call Tony the locksmith from our church. And Tony is an amazing young guy. I thought he could do it, but he said, give me about 20 minutes and I'll be there. And at his word, Tony showed up on time. And so I want you to imagine this in your, your mind. As Tony shows up, he turns the light from his car onto my unmoving car that's sitting in the dark. And he says, give me about 30 minutes. Your car will be up and ready and I'll have some keys for you. And I'm thinking, this guy's just bluffing. He's, he, he, he's confident, but I need to know for myself. So me and my stubbornness, I stood in that freezing cold until Tony was done. But sure enough, my friends, by the 30th minute, Tony was twisting these new car keys in this car engine, and my car was turned on. I looked at him and I said, man, you are a lifesaver. Brother, how in the world did you do that? And my friends, his response toward me is going to help us close this message this morning. He looked at me and he said, Ed, not only was I born to do this, but I live for moments like this. People don't realize that everything that they need for their car is actually in the car. And so he went to the steering wheel and he went underneath it. I said, this guy's trying to tear my car apart. <laughs> he goes underneath it. He pulls this piece that I've never seen before in my life. And he said, Ed, on this are the instructions and all of the information that I need to get your car up and running. People don't know that it's there, but it's there. He throws the car keys in my hands and he says, God bless you. I hope that you have a good and wonderful week. Wow. Tony didn't realize it, my friends, but he preached to me that night. That there in the darkness, he moved me from darkness to light. What I could not do in my own strength, someone else came in my place and did it for me. That even in my despair, in my unmoving, in my staggered place where I didn't know where to turn, there was somebody already established to do the work that I could not do. Amen. And he didn't only just do it, my friends, he did it well. Amen. I couldn't see it there that night before the rest of the week. I said, God, I thank you for doing what I could not do. My friends, this morning, I got to ask you again, where is your treasure? You already have established what, but where is it? Because our treasure, like Major said, is not in this physical world. Our treasure is not found in our money, how much we have and how little we have. Our treasure is not in these political parties that just continue to fight. Our, our treasures are not in these beautiful four walls, and our treasures are not even in our own ability. I grew up and I used to always wonder why do the mothers in my church sing this song like this? But they sang it with so much convention, conviction. They used to say, walking in the light. That beautiful light. Ain't it wonderful how the light shines? Those lyrics make sense to me now. We don't have to look far for these treasures anymore because my friends, those jars of clay are us. We are the earthen vessels that God wants to live and place his glory in through us. Exactly. He wants to shine brightly in us so that he can get the glory and that we can just reflect his image for this world as it decays further and further away. So I, I got to let you guys know, if you ever feel abandoned, if you ever feel forsaken, or if you even feel like today is your last day, be encouraged because your strength is not in yourself. Your strength is in the light of Jesus.
Christ. Amen. So I want to ask you guys again, for just a moment, look around you. Maybe, just maybe, there are treasures hidden, tucked away in small and tight spaces that we often overlook. But this time, at this place today, those treasures are no longer amongst us. What if I want to tell you this morning that the treasure wants to live in you? God bless you. In Jesus' name.